Oregon football is red hot. They've won five straight going into the bye week this Saturday. So could they get to the college football playoff in 2022? Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked on Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin, D1 play-by-play broadcaster and a lifelong Oregon Ducks fan. Thank you for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. Please like, comment, subscribe if you haven't already, wherever you're listening to or watching the show. Comments on Apple Podcasts like those, five-star reviews over there, anything you feel like you could give that I'm deserving of. I am very grateful, and I'm grateful to LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the Locked On College Network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply. The short answer to the question, can Oregon make the college football playoff, is no. But first, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, I've had a couple people reach out over the, la- over the last couple of days Really just uh, yesterday as, as you're listening to this. And by the way, I'm not at all. You're, you're never going to hurt my feelings. Unless you come in there and be mean. But everybody's coming in and being nice. If I ever get something wrong here on the show and you notice it, by all means, shoot me a message. I'll come on here and correct it. I'm not here to say that I am the all-knowing, all-powerful Spencer McLaughlin or some such nonsense. Sometimes I make mistakes. And I am a one-man wrecking crew here on the pod. I do what I can. But sometimes I mess up a little. And if you shoot me a message and say, hey, I think it's this or hey, I think it's this when I don't know or I get something wrong, I very much appreciate all of that. Reminds me of the scene in Oceans 13 when they have the machine that's digging the channel and Basher is down there, Don Cheadle, and Matt Damon asks him something and Basher says, you know, when they dug the channel, they had teams of guys down here. Normally on a show like this, you'd have a team of people to correct me on the spot, but that's what I have all of you for. And that makes you a part of the show as well, keeping me accountable. So two things. Uh, I said Ben Williams began his career at junior college. That was incorrect. He began at Illinois. He was a freshman All-American, then had to go to junior college after he was off the Illinois team because of a violation of personal conduct policy. And I, I stand by what I said, like, is the athleticism enough to be there in the NFL? I don't know. But that guy is a really good football player. And has been for for quite a while. So Oregon, I think, kind of caught a break there, having him, you know, come to come to the Ducks because he'd committed to the Illini. I think there are a lot of other places that could have uh, perhaps picked him up, but Oregon's clearly been able to keep him on the straight and narrow. That's a great thing to see. The other thing too is, I thought that with targeting, you're always out for the first half of the next game. But some of you in the YouTube comments did a little digging that I had not yet done, and so you saved me the time. Thank you very much, because I have other things I like doing, like, you know, watching the Mariners rip my heart into a thousand pieces. Um, If you're wondering how I'm feeling with that Mariner game, by the way, which I know at least one of you is, uh, think 2015 Alamo Bowl. Yeah, same vibes. Uh, So Dante Manning is not going to be out for, for the first half of the UCLA game because the targeting occurred in the first half. It's if it occurs in the second half that you are out for the first half of the next game. That happened to Kayvon Thibodeau last year and, and DJ Johnson this season. I also stand by the rule is really dumb. You just should not be throwing college kids out of games unless there's malicious intent. Back to the original question, which came in from Animoli Marty McFly via the YouTube comments, which is one of the three ways you get a question answered here on the show, at Smalls underscore 55 or at Locked on Ducks on Twitter. You can also tweet the hashtag AskLODPod or hop in the YouTube comments, get a question answered here on the show. couple of mailbag questions for today. He asks, I'd like to present, great name by the way, Animoli, I don't know what that is, but Marty McFly, whew, that's smooth. I'd like to present a question for your next video. You may do so, as any of you may do at any point in time. I think it's time to ask it. What are the chances Oregon makes it to the playoffs? Assuming they went out, what factors out of their control are working against them? Love the show. Keep putting out great content. I will continue to put out content, whether or not it's great. That's for all of you to decide, but I appreciate the support of the show. So the answer to this is, is it technically possible for Oregon to make the playoff? Yes. Yes. Is it likely to happen? And do I think it's going to happen? No. Couple reasons. First, the schedule is actually pretty favorable going forward, but we have to beat Utah and we have to win at Oregon State. That's not going to be easy. 
and we have to beat Washington. Those are, and we have to beat UCLA, by the way, lest I gloss over the Ducks' next game, which is going to be a tough one, though, at Autzen Stadium, and I like Oregon's chances. Then they'd have to win the Pac-12 championship game because they've already got the Georgia loss. And then the factors that are outside of Oregon's control, let's say they go on a magical run, they keep the good times rolling, and they are 12-1 and as the 2022 Pac-12 champions. Let's say that happens. And like I said, the schedule is not the least impossible thing. You know, again, another Oceans uh, trilogy, which I absolutely love reference there. Livingston's talking about the security system in Oceans 11. He says, well, it's not the least accessible system I've seen, but it's close. That's kind of what it is here. It's not the least likely scenario I've seen in college football to get in the playoff because Utah's got two losses. So they're out of the college football playoff right now, right? Washington was two. Anyone who has two losses, you're not going to get into that top four. Oregon theoretically could get there, but the path is still pretty darn difficult. And if they were to go 12 and one, which would be amazing, absolutely incredible and be a win against either UCLA or USC in the Pac-12 championship game. And we'd have to go undefeated in the conference slate, which no one's ever done since the Pac-12 expanded to 12 teams back in 2011. Even if they got there, that Georgia loss would be looming. So if you have a debate about Oregon being the fourth team, because the likelihood of them getting to the third slot they're going to get some help, right? Tennessee is not going to stay undefeated. They'll lose to Bama this week, I think, even though that game is is in Knoxville at Old Rocky Top. Teams are going to lose. They're going to put themselves in position, but Ohio State, Bama, Georgia, Michigan, all have a really good chance to get there. Clemson's got a great chance to get there. And Oregon's resume would be pretty strong, right? If they're a one-loss conference champion, we've seen before, even in the Pac-12, you can get in. Oregon did it. And Washington did it. They were both one loss conference champions. And I think I'm pretty sure Washington had a loss when when they got to the college football playoff. I think Oregon's resume would be good enough to be in the discussion at 12 and one. But you would need a significant amount of help because what you're looking at with Ohio State and Michigan there, who both look like really strong teams and Michigan, Michigan's got a big game against Penn State this week. One of those teams has to have two losses. Now, they have to play each other, but the guarantee that one of them has a loss going into the big game in 2022 is is far from a lock because those are two very good football teams. Alabama and Georgia, again, have to have two losses because Oregon's got the one loss on their resume. So if you're looking at a one-loss 12-1 and Oregon team or a one-loss Alabama it's going to be Alabama or it's going to be Georgia or another SEC team that, that could come up and, and make us make a surge to try to get into the college football playoff. I think this team is, is good. I know that because I've watched them play half the season. They continue to get better. There's a lot of things that they're doing well, but all of that discussion that, that I was just that I was just having right there, which is you know kind of with you, kind of with myself, I was going back and forth right before I dropped the line. It's all dependent upon the Ducks winning their next seven games, including the Pac-12 championship. And though I think this team is good, I've seen the Oregon teams that have gotten to the national championship games. And I don't think this team has what each of those teams had. And I've mentioned it here on the show. I'll tell you what it is after I remind you this episode brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. These days, Every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain, not 98, not 99, 100% certain you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Go to LinkedIn, post your job, and then add the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs as number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. Go post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. So 
the thing that this Oregon team doesn't have that I think just about every team that gets to the playoff for the most part has, except for the Alabamas and Georgias of the world, but even those teams often have something. You got to have something special. You got to have that one thing that you hang your hat on and say, yeah, this is something or someone that performs at a high level week in and week out, and you know what you're going to get. And in 2014-15, it was Marcus Mariota, Heisman Trophy winner, best player in the country, best player in program history. He was not just there, but he was a third-year player. Now, when he was a freshman, Oregon also could have made it to the national championship game if DeAnthony could have just thrown a block down the sideline against Stanford, but I digress. In 2010, you had a special running back in the Michael James, but you also had an offensive philosophy that was throwing people off, and Chip was in some kind of zone as a coach and a play caller. I think Kenny Dillingham is doing a lot of really good things. It's still not what Chip was doing from from 2009 to 2012, right? That that run is probably never going to be matched for Oregon football. And so do I think this team can win a conference championship? Yes. Do I think they could win a Rose Bowl? Yes. I think that's their ceiling, though. There are still holes, you know, particularly on, on the defensive side where I, I think there are just some limitations. And the other thing, too, is even though they do a lot of things well, the offensive line is good enough to get to a college football playoff. The offensive weapons are good enough. The running backs are good enough. Bo Nix at times plays good enough. But the other thing you have to factor in here is Oregon's on a great run right now. Five straight wins, 40 or more points in in every single game. They're about to go through the meat of their schedule, though. And I think we'll have a better idea of what this Oregon team really is in 2022 once they play basically the month of October. I think Utah is in November, um, but... Washington is, I don't remember the exact date, either early November or late October. You, you guys can certainly look it up. Another thing you can correct me on, because, you know, why why, why not? I'm not right all the time. Um, and I'm doing this from, from memory at the moment with regards to the schedule. But there were a lot of tough games in there. Not that Oregon hasn't been impressive in these wins, but Arizona and Stanford and Washington State was a nice win. But it's not the sort of game that you know, instills me with the confidence to where I can feel that this team is going to go to the college football playoff or put themselves in that position. It's nice to be in that position at this point in the season. I mean, they're the highest ranked one loss team in the country at number 12. They've got number 11 UCLA this week. They could be or next week. They could very easily be in the top 10 if they if they're able to beat the Bruins. That is a realistic scenario. So by default, you're going to give yourself a chance. But Dan Lanning is in his first year as as a head coach, not just Oregon's head coach, as a head coach. And Kenny Dillingham, who I have sung the praises of this week on the show, rightfully so because of the job he's done so far, is for the most part putting up these numbers and making the offense look the way it should against inferior competition. Stanford doesn't have the athletes to keep up with Oregon. Neither does Arizona. Washington State is closer. But if you're down 12 with however many minutes exactly it was in seconds to go in that game, if you're playing Utah or you're playing USC or heck, even UCLA, that's probably not a game you're winning on the road. And I like Washington State a lot. I, I've been high on them over on Locked On Pac-12. I think Jake Dickert's doing a lot of really good things. It's a solid football team. They, they're, they're going to give the Beavs a heck of a push this week in Corvallis because that's a really solid football team. But still, a first-year, first-time head coach getting in the college football playoff, just say that out loud, right? Even though I, I love what Dan Lanning is doing, I think there are areas where they can still improve. The defensive line, the, the pressure has been there on and off. You can't have that. You have to be able – that 2015 team that – you know, the 2010 team was more, more offense-oriented. Certainly, they were in 2014-15 as well. But look at who Oregon had on that defense. Ifo Ekpreolamu unfortunately got hurt. That was an All-American corner. You had Eric Armstead and DeForest Buckner on the defensive line. I like Brandon Dorless and DJ Johnson. They've done a lot of good things. And Dorless, though he has taken a step forward this year and looks like an NFL caliber player, is not as good as either Armstead or Buckner. Like You have to have 
a bevy of NFL players on both sides of the ball. Go look at that Oregon defense. There were a lot of good players, guys who, you know, at least got on a practice squads or saw action here and there. Troy Hill was on that team. He's had a great NFL career. And that was a good player on the team who, who was a starter. So I, I think the roster has a lot of strong, compelling pieces right now. But is it at a college football playoff level? I don't see that, no. And I think that with the schedule that's coming, even though, except for Oregon State, the toughest games are at home. That That is the, if you want to be wildly optimistic, the schedule is favorable this year. And Oregon won't have an offensive line that's this good for at least a year or two when they can get guys in the system and develop them. Although I saw one, saw offensive, one offensive lineman who, who deserves some props and shout out here on the show, Jackson Powers Johnson, I think is great as one of the highest guards on, on, on the West Coast, according to P- Pro Football Focus. I saw that the other day. He's been really good in the time he rotates in. So there's a lot of good players on, on this roster, right? I'm, I'm not denying that. You've got a couple NFL offensive linemen. I like Bo Nix, quarterback. If you got to a national championship game with Darren Thomas, you could certainly get there with, with the way Bo Nix is playing right now. And that's not a shot at Darren Thomas. That's just to point out that Bo Nix is playing at a really, really high level. But even with the scheduling break, I don't think they can beat Utah this year. Well, they're, they're capable of it, but I still think the Utes are a really good team. Although Utah will be feeling down on themselves if they lose to USC this weekend. I don't think it's going to happen. I think the Utes will get it done. But if I'm wrong and Utah loses that game, I wonder how motivated they will be playing on the road at Autzen Stadium. That That is definitely something to follow. But you, you just have to have so many things go your way. Beat UCLA, Utah, Washington, who has taken a little step back from their first month of the season but is still a team that can throw it all over the field. The defense has been a little suspect, and Oregon will hopefully be able to exploit that in in the coming weeks when the Huskies are are in Eugene. But you got Oregon State on the road. That's not a cupcake. And then in the Pac-12 championship game, anybody's guess right now who it could be. It might be Utah again if Oregon is able to get there, right? It could be UCLA for a second time. It could be USC who looks really good. There are just so many things there that I think are working against Oregon that lead me to believe, no, this is not a team that can get to the college football playoff. But the ceiling is still pretty high. Conference championship, win a Rose Bowl. That's a great season in my book. I'll take that right now. And we lost to an SEC opponent at a neutral site in week one. It's usually indicative of winning a conference championship in a Rose Bowl. I think we'd all take that this year as the program continues to build under Dan Lanning and company. But it's not realistic to say a first-year head coach could get to the playoff in in year one when it's his first time being a head coach. It's just that's asking quite a lot. Couple more questions. Uh, this one came in from Nick P via the YouTube comments. These two questions actually did. Uh, maybe after the Arizona game, can you do uh, offensive underperformer and over? I think I know what you're trying to say. Do the same for the defensive side. Maybe throw in some why you think it's the case and what can improve, et cetera. Interesting phrasing there, Nick, my friend. That's uh, that's definitely something that, that I can get to. And I've got an over and under performer on each side of the ball and kind of why those are playing out, which I will tell you about after I remind you that if you haven't tried Built Bar Puffs yet, you're, you're depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys. And guess what? There's a new flavor. Ready? Delicious, indulgent cookie dough. I've had them. They're so unbelievably good. Covered in 100% real chocolate, built has done it again. Cookie dough chunk puffs have a light and chewy texture. They have real cookie dough chunks covered in that wonderful melted and dried on hard chocolate. It is 100% real. It is 100% delicious, 160 calories, a whopping 15 grams of protein. You got to go get yours now. Get your cookie dough chunk puffs today. Go to built.com. Use promo code LOCKEDON15, all caps, one word, to get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKEDON15 to get 15% off at built.com. All right, so next two questions here, starting with the uh, the offensive over and under performer, and then uh, same on the defensive side. So let's start on the offensive side. And the over performer, to me, offensively for the Ducks to this point, has been Bo Nix. I thought he could be a, a solid quarterback in the Pac-12. We heard about good Bo and bad Bo. It's been overwhelmingly good Bo 
His completion percentage this year is sky high. It is light years above what he had during his three years at Auburn, which is partially an indictment on the Auburn coaching staffs that were there and also partially a reflection of the caliber of defense that he is going up against. But he has been, like I thought coming into the year, yeah, he can do some good things. He can win games. He can be solid. He can make plays. Just kind of needs to be the reason you don't lose. I didn't think he had a Washington State game in him where he goes for 400 plus yards. I didn't think he'd be hitting this many deep shots and have this great a chemistry and be making these smart decisions time and time again within the offense. One thing Dan Lanning talked about after the Arizona game when he was asked about Bo Nix was, I don't think there was a single play where Bo Nix put the ball in harm's way. And I didn't see one either. Can you think of a single play against Arizona? Is it the best defense in the world? No, but it's a conference opponent, sold out Arizona Stadium, on the road. Can you think of a single time where he threw a ball and you're like, oh boy, I he got away with one there. That was very, very lucky. Yeah, he threw a pick six against uh, against Washington State in league play. Okay, he made a bad throw. Marcus Mariota made a couple bad throws. Darren Thomas made a couple bad throws. Masoli and Herbert, and like everyone makes bad throws from time to time. He has surpassed my expectations at the midway point in the season. And if he keeps playing at this level, it's a huge boon to Oregon's offense. And they can win a conference championship with him playing like this. It's the decision making and, and the fluidity within the offense and the execution that has really risen above what I thought he was even capable of, even though after watching him for a few years at Auburn and, and looking at the situations coming into at Oregon, I was firmly in the mindset of, yeah, he can be a better version of himself. He's gotten better statistically each year. He doesn't turn the ball over as much as everybody thinks. He's going to play against inferior defenses. We've seen that, but he has taken it to another level. He has been, to this point, one of the three best quarterbacks in the Pac-12 consistently. I mean, Caleb Williams has been great. Cam Rising's been great. DTR is in there, so so probably top four, right? Like All those guys have been good, but... Then it's kind of a steep drop-off in in conference play. A lot of people liked Cam Ward a lot. He's been inconsistent and a turnover machine. A lot of people like Tanner McKee and his NFL prospects. Bo Nix has been far better statistically and with the eye test. I think he's been the biggest overperformer. I think the biggest underperformer on offense to this point has been Dante Thornton, though I don't think it's necessarily his fault. He's not on the field very much. Like, I I question whether or not he will stick around after this year because he's a physically gifted, talented guy. I think he was actually higher rated coming out of high school than Troy Franklin, but Franklin has emerged as the Ducks' top receiving target. And I think Chase Cota is kind of filling the void or that that Dante Thornton was hoping to, to step into this season. But I trust the coaching staff here. It's hard to not trust the coaching staff because... If you're saying, well, then why are they playing Coda if Thornton's the younger guy? Because if Chase Coda's better, they're trying to win football games. And they're going to put the players out there who are giving them the best chance to do that. I hope he sticks around because after this year, you know, jury on Dickey hopefully stays committed and, and he'll be coming in. But I think Thornton still has more to give to the offense. And he just hasn't quite, I don't think he's a fluid or, or, um, varied route runner. I I think he's a little bit of a go route, a drag or a post. I think that's kind of what, what he can run comfortably or or what he can do to get open consistently. I think that's why he's not seeing the field a ton. He's also a boundary receiver, right? Someone with that frame is not going to play out of the slot. Troy Franklin can go inside, outside Hudson can kind of go outside but, you know, is mostly inside, but he goes all up and down the field. Same thing with Troy Franklin. Code is an inside outside guy. I think Thornton is someone who they see as a boundary or an X receiver, or, or he could be a Z receiver uh, as well on the strong side of the formation, but he's the guy closest to the sideline. And so I think that limits what he can do because you have a lot of competition and you have a lot of talent there. And I thought he'd be more involved. He had the big catch against Washington State, but he's basically been quiet ever since. I don't think he had a catch, but for maybe one uh, against Stanford, and he did not have one against Arizona. So it, it, it's it's partially underperforming, and it's also partially that he just hasn't gotten onto the field, but he's got to earn that in practice. And clearly to this point, 
uh, he has not. On the defensive side, I'll start with an underperformer here. I know Jeffrey Bossa had a sack and has done a lot of really good things, but I saw the promise for him and hyped him up kind of all summer long coming into this year. And he, he's still a good football player. Don't get me wrong, but he misses more tackles than I think he did from last year, at least from what I'm seeing. I don't have the numbers to back that up. It's just a feel and an eye test sort of thing for me. But when I watch him play, you know, that sack on Jaden Delore where he's the quarterback spy, which, by the way, he's a perfect quarterback spy. I think that is a big advantage, you know, against DTR. I think boss is going to do a lot of quarterback spies, spy stuff, but he's gotten beat in coverage a couple times. He made some nice plays uh, against Washington state and against BYU, but he, he's just been very up and down. I, I feel like the good games have been what I expect to see from him, but, but the bad games have been like, man, he kind of feels like he's, he's taken a step back in, in a sense. And, that, that's something that I hope he improves upon as the year goes on, because I think he can do a lot of things. And we saw him on the field for the first time this year with Justin Flo and Noah Sewell. And because Arizona loved to go three wide, and I thought they might, you had Gonzo and Bridges and Manning and or Florence on, on the field at the same time, but they were running three, three, five. So they were trying to kind of, you know, bunch up the box and, and crowd it a little, but also have a sufficient number of defensive backs on the field. Um, but I, I think that he's just got to improve his consistency. And I, I know it's tough to do, but open field tackling, that's what caught my eye about him so much in, in 2021 was his ability to make plays in space. And he, he's done it in spurts, but I think he's got to be able to, to, to do it more consistently. Uh, defensive overperformer this year. There are a lot of different ways I, I could have gone with this number of different number, number of different players. I'm going with DJ Johnson because he it's not that he hadn't played defense before, but we saw him in the spring game and he was just blowing up Oregon backup offensive lineman. And I thought, man, that that was really good. But then I remembered like, ah, you know, he's played defensive before. And I and I never thought he was uh, a game wrecker or a consistent pass rush guy or anything like that. He had a fumble recovery this week. He was a menace against BYU against the run. He's had a couple of sacks. And when you watch him play, the number of times, if you put a tight end on him, he's going to bull rush the guy over, right? I think just mentally being all in on the defensive side of the ball has helped him a lot. And he's someone who now I really want on the field on third down because I feel like if he's in a one-on-one, -on -one, he may not get a sack all the time, but at the very least, he's going to be able to bull rush the guy and push the quarterback off his spot, collapse the pocket a little I, I've been really impressed, and I think that was a legitimate question mark coming into the season. And I think he is performing well. Little bit of a slow start, right? The pass rush was a problem early in the year. Jaron Hall wasn't sacked, but as the season has gone on, we've seen that defensive front start to pick it up, create some pressure, and, and, and that frees things up, right? When Brandon Dorless and DJ Johnson, Casey Rogers absorb a couple blockers. Then you bring a Bennett Williams down from the secondary and he gets a strip sack. Oregon creates a turnover and, and thwarts an Arizona scoring opportunity. So um, I, I think those are, those are my over and under performers offensively uh, Bo Nix over Dante Thornton under defensively Bossa under and, and DJ Johnson over another question from uh, Nick that I'll answer real quick. Uh, another question for future might be assuming Lanning continues to succeed this year. Does Oregon rewrite his contract or not? Maybe uh, should they wait at this point? Um, maybe pose should they at this point or wait? Um, Nick, work on your question phrasing just a little for me and help, help me out right there. That was rough. Um, I, I don't think that it's at the point in, in the season where they're going to go and they, they need to rewrite his contract to try to keep him here or anything like that. Kenny Dillingham may be a midseason contract rewrite. That could be warranted to, to stop him from looking at head coaching opportunities. He's still really, really young. But you don't talk about coaching contracts till the season is completed. You do not want to go all in on a coach before you see an entire season and know that his teams can go start to finish and have a high level of success. Looks like Dan Lanning and company are on their way to doing that. I, I think a 9-10 win season here in his first year would be pretty darn good. And heck, if they got to 11, that'd be outstanding. I don't see that happening because that means they would win their next six. And I, I think that's just a really, really tough thing to do. But before the season, I thought they go 10 and two. And it looks like they're on their way to doing that if they can keep the offense 
rolling. Keep the questions coming at Smalls underscore 55 or at Locked on Ducks or hop in the YouTube comments. I appreciate everyone listening. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.